there's this one spot high up in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, where for over 2,000 years, you'd come face to face with a giant. As wide as a bus is long, almost as tall as a football field turned on its side, alive since before ancient Romans broke ground on the Colosseum, and soft enough that if you gave it a hug, it'd feel like it was hugging you back. Its name, General Sherman, a giant sequoia, a tree that's one of the largest on planet Earth. That's the Sherman tree. This is actually the best view because once you get up close, you can't see the whole thing. Walk up to its base and it's the equivalent of being a baby chick standing at the feet of Shaquille O'Neal. What you can see is a really fat trunk that's red and it goes straight up. And then as you get about 100 feet up, it breaks off into several really big branches. And those branches are themselves are bigger than most normal trees. This is Christy Brigham. She's the head of resource management and science for Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, which are home to General Sherman. And we should note, the land the Sherman tree is on used to be home to tribes including the Mono, Yokuts, Tabatulabal, Paiute, and Western Shoshone, before they were all forcibly removed. The history of the tree is a bit murky, but we do know that it was named after a guy who was a general in the Union Army during the Civil War. Later, he led violent campaigns against Native Americans. But it was owned before that by a colony, like a socialist colony that was trying to have a idyllic logging and share the profits, and they called this the Karl Marx tree. But then <laughs> when, the, when the government got it, you know, we changed the name. For thousands of years, General Sherman has lived in a sequoia grove with a whole bunch of its buddies, just hanging out, cleaning the air, fighting climate change as trees do. But in September 2021, General Sherman faced a new kind of threat. Two separate lightning spark fires have now merged into the KNP complex, marching towards some of the oldest sequoia groves on the planet. Two fires had combined into an even bigger fire, and that fire was marching straight towards General Sherman and all its friends. Christie and others knew they had to get in there to clear debris from around the base of Sherman to keep it from catching on fire. On a Monday, I was trying to organize a militia, like a bunch of volunteers from resource management who could run up here and rake around these trees that we thought were at risk. And we were all ready and we were texting and I was like, okay, I've got 20 people. We're getting the rakes, we're ready to go. They had their game plan. All they needed was the green light. And then I got a call and they're like, it's not safe, you can't go. And I just, I cried. And so I was really upset, like, like I am now telling you, um, because you feel like you failed, right? The window to do something to protect the trees has passed. Still, Christy hoped and waited. The crazy thing about all this is that we really shouldn't have to worry about giant sequoias burning because they're adapted to living with fire. But now, they're getting wiped out left and right. An extreme fire is decimating many of our forests all across the Sierra Nevada. But there is hope. In the first episode, we talked about how overwhelmingly scary and awful wildfires can be. Now we're going to get into what this new age of wildfire is doing to our forests. We're going to get into the science of why we're seeing such destructive wildfires. And we're going to do that by taking a deep dive into one of the most remarkable tree species on planet Earth, giant sequoias. In this episode, why trees that have been built to handle fire are now being destroyed by it, and what we can do to save them. This is The Big Burn. I'm Jacob Margolis. Back in the early spring, I rented a car with four-wheel drive, picked up senior producer Sophia Police a car, and we set out for Giant Forest. 
we pulled over at the visitor center to pick up Christy Brigham. She was decked out in U.S. Forest Service clothes, just different shades of green from head to toe. So have any of you been here before? Hold on, don't talk to us yet. We need to get set up. <laughs> don't say anything really awesome. We're not ready. <laughs> okay, I'm rolling. What is the meaning of life? <laughs> What's a tough one? We drove up a windy road, scraggly, dry, brown-looking chaparral and oaks, giving way to taller, evergreen trees as we climbed higher and higher up the mountain. All right, so I need you to narrate where we're going. Okay, so we're at a thousand feet elevation, and we are driving up the General's Highway, and we're gonna go up 5,000 feet in elevation. And this is one of the steepest parts of the Sierra Nevada. So this much elevation gain crammed into such a short distance is pretty unusual and really different. We're up high. Anyone feel like they're gonna puke? Everybody doing okay? I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> Even from inside the car, I could feel the air getting cooler as we climbed. Soon we were driving past small patches of dirty snow on the side of the road and the trees started to get bigger and bigger. I thought the incense cedars were impossibly large, but then the giant sequoias came into view. So their canopies are not like the drawing you make of a Christmas tree that's pointy with little spiky pieces. They're like kooky broccolis with one fat arm, and they're so much bigger than anything else. They're the spokes trees of the forest to speak for all the trees that nobody notices. They're pretty overwhelming. Like, I, I can't imagine the first people to come across uh, giant sequoias, what that, that feeling must have been like. Yeah, the native people who lived here knew they were special, and, and the first Europeans who encountered them were blown away, and no one believed them, so then they had to, of course, cut one down and peel all its bark off and send it back east to a World's Fair. They were even more impressive up close. So big. <laughs> you really have to lean up. Yes. Yeah. Gotta lean, lean all the way back to see all the tops. Wow. We followed Christy up a paved path with giant sequoia needles crunching under our feet. Like the rest of California, wildfires are a natural part of these mountains. I was looking around trying to spot the signs. I saw some giant sequoias had black marks all over their shaggy red bark. There seem to be burn holes, like holes that look like they've been burned in the tree. What, yeah. Do you know what those are from? Those are mostly places where there were branches. Okay. And that's a remnant of the branch. And so one of the things that um, fire adapted trees do is that as the as the canopy moves up, they drop their lower branches so that they're not there to carry fire into the canopy. This is part of the giant sequoia's defense system against fire, and it's actually pretty clever. It drops its old lower-to-the-ground branches, which stops the fire from climbing into the tops of the trees. Because if they burn so bad that their tops burn too, it often means death. But giant sequoias aren't just playing a game of defense against fire. They're so well adapted to it that it actually helps them make baby giant sequoias. When a fire comes along, the heat warms up their cones and lots of their seeds drop to the ground. So these little oatmeal, tiny oatmeal looking things, oh, wow. these are sequoia seeds. These could all be... They could all be baby sequoias. You can see how tiny this is. It doesn't weigh hardly anything. It's really light. Some of these seeds will sprout, but only a few will ever turn into the giants around us. And even though it's rare for one single seed to make it big, it's a process that's clearly been working in this giant sequoia Eden. This one spot on the western side of the Sierra Nevada is home to 30 of the largest giant sequoias on planet Earth. A place that for thousands of years has had the perfect temperature, the perfect amount of rain and snow, and the right kind of fire, which is what the seeds need. After you have beneficial fire, you often get carpets of these, 90,000 a hectare, like a dense carpet. 
So this idea of beneficial fire, the kind that these trees have lived with, it's a really important concept for us to understand, because on the opposite end, there's bad fire. Bad fire has been killing scores of giant sequoias that are thousands of years old. So what's the difference between good fire and bad fire? That's after the break. To learn more about good and bad fire, we met up with scientist Nate Stevenson in a different part of the forest. Have you all been here before? Well, we came yesterday with Christy. Oh, where'd you go? Uh, Do you remember? We went to Giant Forest. Giant Forest, right? Nate has a white beard and this air of relaxed patience. He's in his 60s and has spent most of his life studying giant sequoias. Do you love giant sequoias? Do I love giant sequoias? How can anyone not? love giant sequoias. I am passionately in love with giant sequoias. As we walked along a forest path, we were surrounded by the entire life cycle of sequoias on both sides. There were baby trees just starting their journey, and others, as big as buildings, laying on their sides. For years, this forest was shaped by what we're going to call good fire. See, not all wildfires are so hot and violent that they completely destroy everything. You can have a whole range of intensities that fire nerds would classify anywhere from low to moderate to high severity. What we used to see in this area and in a lot of our forests was mostly low and medium severity fire. Imagine fire dancing along clearing out brush and leaves and some trees, and leaving giant sequoias and other older trees scorched, but still alive. We used to see these types of fires frequently, and they were good because they cleared out fuel buildup, which means debris that naturally builds up in the forest. Debris that would otherwise drive more destructive wildfires. These smaller fires also made room for new trees to grow. So, if a couple hundred years ago, you flew a helicopter above this forest, Nate says that if you looked down, you would see open patches, like holes in a block of Swiss cheese. Most of it would be this green canopy, but every once in a while you'd find a little hole in that canopy where the fire burned extra hot, where there might have been some logs had fallen over, a big tree had fallen over there and created a pile of fuel. Um, Those holes would be maybe a quarter of an acre to sometimes as big as one or two acres. Those were the hot spots for sequoia regeneration because sequoia seedlings really need uh, an opening in the forest. They need the bare mineral soil that's exposed by fire. Um, The heat pulse from the fire opens the cones and seeds rain down. And then they don't have a lot of competition in the middle of that hole. Um, The roots from outside trees can't quite reach that area, so there's extra water available in the center of that opening, and they get a lot of sunlight, and boy, do they love sunlight. So it's it's the sweet spot, you know? So the Swiss cheese view that you would see a few hundred years ago was normal. So there's always little holes getting punched in the forest by fires back then. There used to be this balance of fire, but now it's out of whack, Nate says. Now we're seeing these gigantic areas, you know, hundreds of acres at a time, maybe even a thousand that burn so hot, all or most of the sequoias are dead. And um, that we think is out of bounds of the way things worked in the past. So it could be a new phenomenon. Nate took us to a spot where sequoias once stood. Now it was just a bare hillside covered in ash. The trunks of former giants completely blackened burned matchsticks silhouetted against the sky. This is the result of a landscape hit by a lot of high severity fire. Flames that aren't helpfully clearing debris, but growing so hot and so large that they're incinerating everything. Looking back, Nate says, it was the rough fire in 2015 that signaled a big shift in his understanding of what giant sequoias had in store. It was clear pretty early on that 
that was the most sequoias I had ever seen killed in a fire. Um, it still didn't concern me that much because you can always chalk that up as, well, that was a fluke. The real gut punch was 2020 and the Castle wildfire because the satellite imagery started coming in, a few drone shots started coming in, and the size of areas in which every sequoia was killed were just mind-boggling. Nate knew it was bad even before the pictures arrived. He could see huge smoke plumes from his deck 30 miles away. There was ash drifting down. I could look and identify the tree species, and I was going, oh my gosh, here's charred pine needles falling out of the sky, charred fir needles, oh, here's cedar. Look, here's some oaks. And I saw sequoia ash falling out of the sky at my house, 30 miles from the grove that was burning, and I knew it was bad. It was um, almost, you know, disbelief mixed with grief. It meant that the tree's defense mechanisms hadn't worked, that their leaves 250 feet up in the air were burning, what's known as a crown fire. And it usually means death. An estimated 10,000 giant sequoias died in that one fire. Nate says that over the last two summers, we've lost an estimated 13 to 19 percent of them. And it's not just the giant sequoias. High severity fires have become more common over the past several decades across many of our western forests, sometimes hitting the same areas repeatedly. Burning landscapes so intensely, it's unclear whether they'll recover to become forests again. And it's left me wondering, why now? It's complicated, but a big part of the answer is climate change. I reached out to Patrick Gonzalez, a climate change scientist who's been studying this stuff for 30 plus years and has had a special focus on our national parks. Human-caused climate change has doubled the area burned by wildfire across the western U.S. above natural levels. Patrick explained there are a few things going on with climate change. One is that it's causing more intense heat waves, and two, it's making our droughts a whole lot worse. Like right now, parts of the western U.S. are living through the worst drought in well over half a century. Everything is super dry, and that makes wildfires worse because dry, hot landscapes burn more easily. Which is why we generally see our worst fires here at the tail end of summer. But the other thing is, all this extreme weather has caused a huge die-off of trees in our forests, over 100 million of them over the past decade. And dead, dry fuel burns really well. And as temperatures get hotter, Patrick says, things are going to get worse. If the United States and the world, if we don't cut carbon pollution from cars, power plants, and other human sources, uh, global temperature could increase by four degrees Celsius, which is like eight degrees Fahrenheit. And under that case, the tree mortality in the Sierra Nevada could increase by 50%. So we would see a lot more of those stands of dead trees. Another part of the worst case is a potential tripling of the area burned by wildfire uh, with no climate change action. Forests are a really important defense against climate change because they suck up a lot of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. But because of climate change, more of our forests are burning, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, making climate change worse. We're in this messed up feedback loop, and if these trends continue, we're going to lose a key tool in our fight against climate change. Back with Nate talking about the giant sequoias, our forests, the future of everything was heavy. And I asked him, how do you even begin to process where things are headed? This landscape that I thought was timeless, that would always be there, always looking the way it looks now, is changing and is changing rapidly. That's, that's really hard to accept. You know, we all live in this crazy, amped up world where 
things are happening really fast all the time and it can wear you out. And then you visit a national park and at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, you calm way down and you realize there's something much bigger than you out there, something more enduring, more permanent. When I was in my teens, I was lucky enough to go on a backpacking trip here. And at the time, I had a lot going on, you know, having issues with friends, a uh, hard time in school, just trying to figure out the kind of person I was. My brain, just a tangle of anxious thoughts. And I was really unhappy. But when I was carrying that heavy backpack, sleeping outside, surrounded by trees and marmots, and just eating so much canned tuna that it now makes me nauseous when I smell it, my mind quieted. And for the first time in a long time, I felt okay. But being back in Giant Forest, seeing the way it's changed, I just want to so badly know if it'll still be around. For me, you know, for my kids. Really for everybody. Maybe you felt some of this existential ache too. When landscapes that you grew up with, the ones that brought you joy and peace are taken away by climate change. There's actually a word for it. Solastalgia. It's a combination of the words solace and nostalgia. And sometimes we talk about climate change in terms of projections, like how hot the planet will get and what we could lose in the future. Solastalgia is the way we feel now about what's already happening. And it's easy to live in this place of darkness in your mind, and I kind of expected to have my dark feelings reinforced by my visit to see, you know, burnt out giant sequoias. But what I learned is that there's still hope to be found. That it's still possible for us to intervene and save our forests from at least some of the catastrophic fire. Which brings me back to Christie's fight to save General Sherman. After the break, a wild plan, a window of opportunity, and space blankets. When we left General Sherman, it was defenseless in the face of oncoming fire, and Christie had been told that conditions were too dangerous for a rescue operation. She was gutted. But then two days later, after that, I got a call at 5.30 in the morning. Um, it was hilarious because I don't sleep with my cell phone. My cell phone's downstairs. So they called my husband, who does sleep with his cell phone. And he's like, I hear him go like, hello. And it was the superintendent. And he's like, we've got a window. Where's your militia? We're going to go break. The pictures are wild. The air filled with smoke. A crew of about 30 people literally raking several feet of pine needles away from the trees. And then they brought out the giant aluminum blankets. Firefighters have used an innovative approach to minimize damage to the trees. They've wrapped their base in a fire and heat resistant material and cleared much of the brush from the area. It's a last line of defense if they're not able to slow the fire down. The idea is to prevent embers from burrowing beneath the tree's bark and killing it from the inside out. And so the crew rushed to wrap the base of General Sherman like a Chipotle burrito in giant space blankets, hoping to insulate it from the worst to come. Don't you think he looks good? Majestic, a survivor. General Sherman made it. There it was, enormous, awesome, in the original sense of the word. Christy let us climb over the fence so we could get close. I like to hug them. We like, hug it? Of course. Can we hug? Okay, I gotta hug the tree. Oh God, I gotta <laughs> hug the tree. Lifelong dream tree. Heck yeah. This is really the only reason I did the podcast, was so <laughs> we could work our way here to hug the tree. Arms wrapped around Sherman, for a bit, the solastalgia went away. And we were just there, being all cheesy, just enjoying the wonders of nature while we still have them. I love these trees. I mean, they're, they're amazing. They've lived for over a thousand years and they lived through previous fires and droughts and 
being around them is really powerful and it's such a testament to endurance and nature's ability to withstand and so the loss emotionally of those trees is upsetting and it's also upsetting because it didn't have to be this way the water the foil the fire retardant were worst case scenario defenses but there's another part to this story Even though destructive, high-severity fire burned through other parts of the park, killing lots of giant sequoias, when it got to giant forest, something amazing happened. Once the wildfire got into the heart of giant forest, it really laid down and actually went out. Giant forest did not get destroyed by high-severity fire, in part because giant forest is different from lots of forests across the western U.S., Many of the forests getting decimated by high-severity fire have had fuels building up in them for over 150 years. And I can't emphasize this point enough. Fuel buildup is a huge deal. And the reason for all this fuel buildup? Instead of letting good, low to moderate fire naturally clear out debris and small trees, for over a century, we've prioritized putting out fires in our forests. I know this sounds counterintuitive, but putting out those fires has resulted in worse wildfires. In giant forests, though, the National Park Service has been setting their own good fires for decades. So when a bad fire shows up, it doesn't have all this extra fuel to burn. This burn program is amazing. The people who have been working here at Sequoia and Kings Canyon for three decades, the work that they have done is amazing and it saved giant forests. But have we done enough of it? Absolutely not. The answer is to actively manage, to do the prescribed burning, to do the restorative thinning. The answer is to manage these forests so that they are fire resilient as they're meant to be. You've probably heard about this before. It's called prescribed burning. Before Europeans showed up, Native American tribes intentionally burned the land for all sorts of reasons. To clear space for food to grow, to hunt game, and yes, to reduce the risk of destructive wildfires. We see that prescribed burning slows down and even helps stop big fires. That forests that have had these treatments are more resilient to heat and water stress in the face of climate change. And for me, that's reason to hope. Here's what's wild about all this. This problem of fuel buildup had once been solved in California by the tribes who lived here. And then, about 150 years ago, it all went catastrophically wrong. When you're running for your life, when you are constantly worried that somebody's gonna show up and, and shoot you, that prevents you from being able to do things like cultural burning. That's next time on The Big Burn. The Big Burn is created, written, reported, and hosted by me, Jacob Margolis. Shana Naomi Krokmal is our Vice President of Podcasts. Antonia Sarahito and Leo G are the executive producers for LAS Studios. Our producer is Minju Park. Additional production by Natalie Chudnovsky. Our intern is Bruno Lopez Vega. Anjuli Sastry Kerbacek is the senior producer. Editing by Sophia Polisa Carr and Meg Kramer. Fact checking by Caitlin Antonios. Sound design and mixing by E. Scott Kelly. Original music by Andy Clausen. Our website, LAS.com, is designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital and marketing teams at LAS Studios. The marketing team of LAS Studios created our branding. Artwork for this show by Dan Carino. Thanks to the team at LAS Studios, including Taylor Kaufman, Sabir Brara, Kristen Hayford, Kristen Muller, Andy Orozco, Michael Cosentino, and Leo G. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live the Strelo family, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Big Burn is a production of LAS Studios. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.